Manager of Partnerships um, at NYC Media Lab. So that means I really get to build the relationship between our corporate members as well as our university partners, um, executing on projects like the VR fellowship that we ran with Viacom, um, the prototyping challenge that we're running with uh, Verizon. Um, it's really you know, different engagements that we're bringing together, um, execs who are experimenting with new technologies, um, matching them with faculty and students um, at the campuses. So for today, here at um, Exploring Future Reality, our second year of the conference, it's just so exciting to see how this has really grown. Um, we have a panel focusing on um, the hardware and software, um, as well as how um, you know, university faculty are um, you know, developing the talent pipeline here in New York City. So you'll hear from a range of perspectives in this next panel. Um, we will have um, each of the speakers actually give brief presentations, and then I will invite each of the speakers up to have a conversation here, and then we will open up for questions uh, with the audience. Um, so actually, I would like to invite our first speaker. Um, his name is Winslow Burleson. Um, he is a faculty member at NYU College of Nursing. He leads the NYU X Lab, which he'll share. Um, it connects research efforts around VR and AR in health, technology, education, and innovation. Um, before joining NYU, he was a faculty member in engineering at Arizona State University, and he earned his PhD at MIT Media Lab. Um, so today he'll share with us um, really a holodeck uh, research um, effort. Welcome. Um, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Justin. It's wonderful to be back here at the New York City Media Lab uh, to see so many familiar faces, many new faces. Um, some of my collaborators, Ken Perlin, uh, Jeremy Rowe, um, Javier Molina, um, so many of uh, the people that are making all this happen. Um, we have just received the major research instrument award from the National Science Foundation, the only one for 2016 at the large scale. So we have a five-year, $4 million project to build an experiential supercomputer, an NYU holodeck. Uh, so this is what we uh, submitted to the NSF, this picture suggesting that we could have a collaboration from multiple individuals, even social robots, avatars, agents, in a co-located and distributed space. So here you see a biochemist working with a social robot to build a virtual DNA strand as a 3D printer is printing it from the ceiling and a remote musician is looking at the xylophone properties of the music that is being built. Um, so that was the proposal of looking at how we can span the many modalities that are emerging in today's technologies. So can we do uh, active AR and VR uh, in concert with distributed displays. So we have the Reality DAG, Cave 2, Allosphere, some of these high-end platforms. Those are largely visual, sometimes acoustical. Uh, what we want to do is combine well beyond that, and you'll see in the other modalities. We have one of the strongest um, music technology studios in the city and music technology programs. So we have Anishka Rajinka working here as one of our co-PIs uh, leading that and having that capacity in binaural speaker arrays, microphone arrays, this bi-directional capture and uh, produce the sounds that we would like to experience in future reality. So uh, this is really an instrument where as we bring these things together, we want to allow people to explore what's possible in this. So this is not the research agenda, but is the instrument that will allow many of your research agendas, many of your experiences and the things that you'd like to create and deploy for others to be prototyped. Just to give you an example of that, we've been working with uh, NYU Wireless that wasn't an original partner of the proposal, but to write a new grant that would allow them to be a new partner in the proposal, build their own holodeck node, and then we would have high-end wireless as well as the many things that we're going to be putting in. We have moderately high-end wireless, but theirs is state-of-the-art. So uh, here we see the haptic or physical dynamic. So we want to combine the gesture, motion capture, uh, data gloves, as well as physical fabrication. So the 3D printing, the laser cutting, the ability to build electronics in a co-located space. So if you invent something with collaborators in the same room or in two or three of the rooms, we have one room in the medical corridor, one in Tandon in engineering in Brooklyn, and one in the main campus in Washington Square. If we pool our resources and expertise across those domains, 
create something, we actually want to physically have it and walk out of the holodeck with it. So here we see an infant um, heart that's used for pre-surgical planning and nursing education. So this is printed, colored, and the surgeons have a better understanding after using this of what they want to do when they actually go into surgery. The nurses have a better understanding of how to communicate with their patients and their patients' parents uh, about the conditions that they're experiencing. Here we see the uh, human dynamic. So there's a rich array of what we can understand about you. Uh, there's the brain-computer interaction, there's the eye tracking, the respiration, the skin conductance. We want to fuse all of those, and we're calling that the human dynamic. So Ken Perlin's been making these amazing touch-sensitive floors and pads that can sense very uh, sensitive uh, capacities. And so we're covering the walls and the floors with that capacity. You know, so we're partnering with institutions, organizations, experts, uh, and each of those individuals is bringing their expertise, leaving that in the holodeck so many others can use it, but then also benefiting from all that use that all the others are using so they get all that own, their own data to make their instrument stronger. Beyond the human dynamic, we can look at the social dynamic. How do teams of individuals not only express competency, but confidence and creativity? So how do these nurses or uh, multifaceted interdisciplinary teams interact with one another? If they see something going on, do they have the confidence to step up and say, hey, I think that's maybe not the right way to do it, or I think we can do it better? Do they have the leadership to uh, you know, challenge authority and then participate? So one of the major causes of aircraft uh, accidents is that you have a new team coming together for the first time and the co-pilots aren't willing to challenge the pilots. That's the kind of training that we want to provide, understand the social, emotional interactions that are occurring in real time, how we can both train individuals but then also create the interventions for both the person in authority and the person who needs the confidence building activity so they can practice that uh, so that we can make these systems work better for all of us in our everyday lives. To drive all this, we want to team up with uh, places like IBM Watson, the AI powerhouses. Um, we want to look at how the wisdom of crowds and, and high-end wireless can uh, fuse into this scenario. So that's what the infrastructure on this slide predicts. And then the applications. So we go out and find some of the best applications that are emerging around the world. Uh, JPL is putting astronauts uh, on the surface of Mars uh, and coupling them with geologists and robots to better understand how to do field planetary science. So again, we just wrote another proposal with them looking at how to take a virtual crater and do science in that virtual crater and compare it to the science that you can do in the real crater. So right now, we think if we go to a planet, we get pretty good science. We do not know. We might only be able to get 80% of the science or 50% of the science, but all of NASA's missions have been premised that we get 100% of the science. So that's a very important piece of understanding how much we can do. And then also, if we only think we can get 50%, is there a way that we can recover some of that? Can we get from 50 back up to 80 or 85 by the way we present it, by the tools that we provide people to do this kind of uh, offline and real-time interaction? Other scenarios include, um, I think, yeah, so this is one we've been going into classrooms um, across the country with a social agent, a social robot. And uh, this robot encourages you to think of your mind as a muscle. And even though this can be hard and frustrating, you can grow your intelligence if you persevere with it. So Quinn here is engaging multiple individuals um, in that scenario. And uh, so, so, you know, as a learning scientist, when we deploy this, we don't know if for one or another reason it doesn't work as well as we think. We, it might be because we're not roboticists. Whereas in the holodeck, if we team with roboticists and we have these great robots to choose from, then as learning scientists, in the same way that we use the, the pads and the you know, pressure pads and the wireless, we get the benefit of having high-end, robust robots that then allow our learning science to work. Uh, and um, in contrast, the roboticists get all that data from hundreds of students working with their robots, stuff that they would never actually go out and be able to do alone without the learning scientists. So that's really the piggybacking and synergy. Uh, here, we're partnering with the New York Hall of Science and the Liberty Science um, Center and looking at how we can deploy this. They have two million visitors a year. So as we get to the later years of our project, we're going to have platforms that go out into these institutions and create amazing experiences for very large uh, numbers of audiences. And that can also be a place where you can explore and prototype your experiences. Uh, we have a great team, all of these uh, individuals, many of whom are here today. 
uh, and many, many partners who are interested in doing research on this platform, who wrote letters to the National Science Foundation saying, if this exists, I'll write proposals to do this work. We'd like to add your logos, your partnerships, uh, your expertise to this mix and uh, understand how we can help you do your work and how you can uh, engage with us to explore the future of reality. So with that, I look forward to the discussion that we'll have in the next couple minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Winslow. So we'll definitely be covering technical partnerships in our uh, panel conversation. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Mark Squarek. Um, he is a faculty member at NYU Tandon School of Engineering, particularly in the Integrated Digital Media Arts Department, teaching 3D graphics and a graduate level uh, mobile AR course. Um, and he's also the CEO of Semblance AR, which I'll touch on in his slides as well. So I'm Mark Squarek. I'm a full-time faculty member at NYU Tannen School of Engineering uh, Integrated Digital Media Program. Um, uh, through that, I'm the director of uh, NYU's Mobile Augmented Reality Lab, where we focus on uh, research and development in the field of uh, mobile augmented reality. So really, something that's in your pocket right now, not five or six years out. Um, this is one of my first works with mobile augmented reality. This is the BP logo hack. Uh, World Trademark Review cites this as the first logo hack. So this is the first time you're generating um, kind of digital content on top of a trademark logo or something like that, um, which would be subversive or uh, contrary to uh, what the trademark logo intender, uh, intended. Um, those, uh, other works that we've done, I've done, would be the uh, intervention in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it was in the New York Times twice. Um, but what this was was really kind of questioning the line when you're doing mobile augmented reality, um, the uh, difference between public and private space. Um, we hear a lot about this with Pokemon Go nowadays, where these people are going into the Holocaust Museum, the um, uh, World Trade Center Memorial, and um, where is that line? Where can we stop people from actually creating work and content? Um, and this work was really one of the first ones that uh, brought that question into the public sphere. Uh, another work that I did that was actually quite significant would have been the protests during the Occupy Wall Street movement. This is in front of the New York Stock Exchange. We had probably about like 35 artists in this at intervention um, from around the world uh, cre creating and generating um, virtual content at the Stock Exchange. They had this whole area basically gated off and um, basically saying you can't kind of go in this space. When I arrived there, it's basically screaming for an intervention. If you have a space where they're telling you you can't go, um, this is the place to put the work. Um, the laws are currently still technically sort of on your side. They're starting to actually put things into law right now, stopping you from doing this. But again, um, we had, uh, you know, like 35 artists from all over the world, including Africa, like um, Japan, China, Korea. Um, so really a voice, a global voice kind of taking place here, and they were being heard. Um, and um, some of the bigger messages that were kind of coming out of this, you have to go there to see it. So we're creating this kind of excitement at the event, which would... Um, get people who might not normally become part of the protests to come out and participate. Um, this is another work that I did. This was at the uh, Korean border. This is at Panjimam. I actually did the first augmented reality work in North Korea. Um, so the idea of this work was to patch over the scars of war um, that were kind of going, taking place in the kind of Korean society. And um, there's sort of this new understanding with the younger generations that um, uh, they see themselves as separate, whereas the older generations used to see them Korea as a united uh, country, and now they're starting to see themselves as a very separate place. And um, this was supposed to show a, a country united um, and what it could look like uh, without the kind of war. Uh, this was in the British Museum. We stole the Parthenon marbles. Um, we're returning them to Greece. Um, so this is a screen capture. None of this stuff, um, this would not be post-production. It actually works on site. You're looking at the plinths, and they're empty. And you can go back there and see them. And, we're moving him back to Greece to uh, rebuild the Parthenon. Um, uh, this, is the, the, this is great from the last presentation. This is the surface of the moon. This is a scale surface of the moon. But we're actually doing it in Bushwick. We're not doing it in a, a, a fancy holodeck. Um, and this was on a budget. And so you can basically call it the surface of the moon. You can kind of run around. Um, we were making these little lunar sort of uh, habitats. Um, so again, I was this, uh, the CEO of Simulates Augmented Reality. I started this quite some time ago. Um, uh, what we're doing is work like Pokemon Go uh, many years back, um, and you would basically go to a specific site location. If you played there, you fought, you won, you could own the land, you could sort of fortify it, so um, giving you sort of ownership over different properties. There are other games out there right now which are a little more abstract. You're basically playing through a map type interface. Um, in this iteration, you would be actually owning physical space, and then you could start to redesign it. Um, 
Uh, we're, my company's also working right now on a version of Skype, um, 3D Skype, that's what we say. We're kind of stealth right now, but um, this is the direction it goes. It's working, we're looking for investors. So, um, I'm also the, uh, one of the lead editors at um, Fun Magazine. So this is the world's first fully augmented reality magazine. So it's the entire magazine's augmented reality. You're not really looking quite so much at the page, but um, the augmented experience that's taking place um, as you start to move through the the, uh, your reader's experience. Um, uh, we're looking for people. So if you guys do augmented reality work, you can reach out to me. Um, I'm curating basically this magazine. We're on the third issue, which is coming out. It's like a cult phenomena. Um, it's going uh, amazingly well right now. Um, so very exciting. This is all kind of pioneering stuff. Um, we're coming up with new strategies to create these um, narratives, documentaries. How do we do it like not in the page with text? How do we kind of pull it out of the page and throw it into 3D? Um, which gets pretty exciting. One of the bigger projects we're working on is actually with um, public safety at NYU. We're creating a um, public safety app. We're turning normal cops into sort of super cops. We're giving them superhuman abilities. And um, we do this by, you, largely through augmenting their vision. We don't want to encumber their entire vision, so it's um, a little kind of headset off, off to the display. Um, we're working with Music. We actually have a number of industry partners working with us on this part, project right now. Um, we're working with, like, NYU is the head of public safety. Um, essentially, I could look at this entire room just sort of taking a glance and I could pick out all the offenders um, pretty quickly without too much difficulty. We have a working prototype of this in place. Um, so we could spot you, we could find you. Um, I know if you guys saw the last RoboCop, I could jump across the crowd and pull you out of the crowd and, and detain you. Um, and then you know, on the darker side, one of the things we're working again with the head of NYU's public safety on this, they're worried about active shooters. We've been incredibly fortunate that nothing like this has happened, and we really hope that something like this won't happen. Um, but it's a reality that we live in nowadays, unfortunately. We've got navigation systems that work in the interior of NYU's campus. Um, so we've mapped out all the spaces. We can create basically exit routes uh, or different ways of moving people through spaces, be it first responders or people who are on site. We actually work on different levels um, of knowledge in this sphere, tell you where to go. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mark. So next up, uh, we have Michael Calvert. He actually is the lead games evangelist at Sketchfab, the world's largest platform to publish, share, and discover 3D content online and in VR. He's also an independent game developer. Um, so Michael, feel free to take it away. Cool. Can you hear me? Sweet. So Sketchfab, I, I mainly do the, the game stuff at Sketchfab, but it does a, we do a bunch of other stuff. There's 3D scanning, there's cultural heritage, there's tons of people that use Sketchfab, but I'm just going to talk about the game stuff today. So um, Sketchfab, you can upload basically any 3D content to it. So if it's an FBX, OBJ, you just drop it on the website and you have it in a 3D viewer online. Any of that content online is viewable with any headset in VR. Um, we work with tons of tools, including game engines, Unity, Minecraft. Um, just kind of glance through all this stuff, just so you understand what Sketchfab is. Um, I work with all the game studios and the different game developers, and today we work with around 70 AAA game studios, and I work with around like 300 indie studios. Um, the entire Sketchfab community itself is roughly a half million creators, so that's just people creating content. Nothing on Sketchfab is something that we create at the company, it's all user generated. And there's um, over a million 3D scenes on the site. And again, like all those scenes you can view in VR with any headset today. So if you were to jump into a scene, this is what it would look like on the Vive, and you could literally te teleport around it and kind of get a glimpse before having to download an app. Um, you could even set it up how you want, like if um, you want this castle to be scaled to someone, you could scale them down to be the right size and set that experience. And you could do that and check that out at sketchfab.com slash VR. But the, the real reason I'm here is because I do a lot of stuff in the games community and I develop a lot. Uh, so I run the New York Unity user group. Uh, we, we have a little over 1,400 members. We do around 20 events. so like. One kind of recap, and then one kind of like we work together on projects. Uh, the past year, we've made roughly around 70 projects. We worked early on with Manhattan VR and the project over there, John Benton. So 
you'll see stuff like kind of spattered around that we kind of worked with together as a, a crew. Um, if you want to check out our meetup, meetup.com slash unity 3D. Um, other things that we did, we did a VR jam. There's roughly 140 people. The, the cool thing about this was around 80% of the people that showed up had never done a hackathon, never seen Unity, never done 3D modeling. So there's five of us that went into, we kind of mentored a bunch of different groups of five people, and 30 projects came out of that in 48 hours. And you could play them all at online vrjam16.com. Um, if you uh, feel a little salty about you know, things that happened recently, there's also a, a fun game there for you. Uh, we also do a lot of mentoring around the world. Uh, lately, or more recently, we've been working with the Pixel Art Games Academy in Pakistan and teaching them how to create games in VR and 3D. Uh, we do a Skype call with them every couple weeks. We work with uh, different different countries, uh, different studios around the world. There's one in Pakistan, there's one in Afghanistan, uh, in Indonesia, but uh, this is the most recent one, and this has been really fun. I don't know what happened there, but uh, we do a lot of game jams together, too. So we try to get scholarships for a bunch of us to go do game jams. The last one we did was Train Jam, which was a game jam on a train to the Game Developers Conference. And that's roughly like 72 hours. Um, a lot of fun. Like, I actually wasn't tired. We didn't sleep too much. But it was just, like, so cool to be, like, in every biome in America. Like, one second you're in a desert, go use the restroom, you come out, it's snowing. Uh, so what am I working on? Recently, we polished up a, a game that we're working on called Potions 101. So it's an augmented reality <laughs> dice game for kids. So the, the idea here is that you're a bunch of witches and you're, you're basically challenged to guess what the recipe is for a potion. And on the die, on each side, there's different ingredients. And you will roll the die, and you would decide if you want to flip the dice and say, like, you know, I think this is the right mixture. And then the ingredients would pop out of the die, jump into the cauldron. The cauldron would bubble and shake and say, like, you got two or three right. And you would go in a circle and play this game. And all, all you have to do is print out, we had printable uh, game sheets and you'd make custom die. Um, we open sourced it, so if you want to go just to this part of the website, you can find it really easy. Um, and there's, there's another like 50 games on the, our GitHub as well. The one thing I can't talk too much about, because I want to like show it more when I release it in a couple months, but uh, I've been working on a game called Little Fuzzballs. It's uh, about me and my dog. If you know me, my, uh, my dog is like, with me 90% of the time. And uh, you, you've probably seen me walking around New York with weird rigs. Uh, this game is, so like in this like snapshot here, which is a video, it's me uh, recording my walk to work and back home from my dog's perspective. Because you get to play as my dog and you get to play as me. And I wanted to do a study on scale to get it right in VR. And uh, it's really fascinating seeing the world from his short legs. And like, I, I real, it was really weird. Like I did it for a month. And in all the footage, about 70% of it is like him looking up to me, which is like the most endearing thing ever. <laughs> um, I also wore a rig too. And uh, some things I can say. So in the game, like, it's a game about diversity. Um, basically, I uh, go away on a, a trip. And I have kind of a loving doofus friend watch my dog. And he, my dog gets away and goes on like a homeward bound adventure. And you get to play with, as him like that. And uh, I kind of figure out something's wrong and come back and have to find my dog. Um, so you're playing from both an animal perspective and a human perspective. And the secret subtle thing, it's a game about diversity because it forces you to talk to people in different ways that you normally wouldn't in a big city or in a country. Uh, when I moved to New York, I found it very interesting coming from kind of a suburban life that no one talks to you in your building unless you engage them. So in this game, like secretly, we're trying to get people to talk to each other and have more of a kind of a homey country kind of atmosphere. Um, outside that, like I've been doing a lot of weird vol volumetric recording with this game, with the rigs I have. So when you play the game outside the 3D, you get to see like actual clips of real life pop into the game. But I don't want to show it today, because <laughs> I'm going to release it in a month. Outside that, um, I haven't been up to much, just traveling around, doing game jams. But this is, uh, this is where you can find me. That's okay. it. Thank you.
you, Michael. So next up, we have Jim Preston. He's coming um, from the hardware side, um, coming from FOVE. He leads strategy and business development. Um, FOVE is actually a Kickstarter project. Um, it has made headlines for its eye tracking technology, um, as well as its lightweight headset. He actually will um, have a demo if you haven't tried it yet. It'll be available um, after um, the panels and the um, talks here. Um, so yeah, Jim, feel Thank free. Thank you. Is a uh, mic working? Yeah. Uh, okay, so my, my presentation lacked visual richness as my laptop died and I've been on the road for an entire week. So this deck was built on my phone in the back of an Uber. So at least I have two videos. So, uh, and I only have four slides, so I will have message discipline uh, during this presentation. Uh, okay, so Fove, um, uh, as Amy mentioned, we are an eye tracking headset. We're actually in the room. We can be demoed later on. Uh, we're coming to market at the end of this year. Uh, we're not going out to consumers. We're not competing with Rift or the Vibe or the PSVR. Uh, we're basically the headset you'll be having in 2018. So it's an eye tracking headset. Okay, I'm not going to drill down into these. The, the question I get a lot is uh, why eye tracking? What's the big deal? And it's, it, it, and I try not to overstate it, but it, the fact of the, rea the reality is uh, eye tracking is used for dozens of applications, and it's really hard to actually list them all. The ones I'll speak to very briefly are in the upper corner, which are simulated depth of field and foveated rendering, which is the what most of the hardware manufacturers and the chip manufacturers want right now. So basically that is the idea by doing pupil tracking, we can know exactly where you're looking. We can do ray cast basically out of your eyes and know where your focal plane is. And we could do depth of field based upon where you're looking. So we can have lower res textures for areas that you're not actually focused on. That's what foveated rendering is as well. It's basically just focusing on the area that you're looking at because your regular peripheral vision, you actually aren't, don't really see very much. You don't actually see in color in your peripheral vision. You don't see a great deal in your peripheral vision. Your brain sort of stitches it together. And the idea is on the rendering side, there's no reason to fully render pixels that the user's not paying attention to. So the GPU savings is tremendous. Uh, so that's why folks like NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, Intel uh, are very much interested in that. Uh, that's the most immediate impact of eye tracking. Uh, there's going to be tremendous impacts around things like the game mechanics. Shooters are going to have to get rethought. Uh, story. Uh, characters are going to know when you're looking at them. They're going to know where you're looking on them, why you're looking at their gun, that sort of thing. Telepresence. Uh, this is something a great deal of interest in this. Basically something like imagine if you're a car manufacturer and you want to have several different people in different parts of the world all looking at a highly complex model and you want to make sure that they're all looking at the exact same bolt. Uh, that's why you're going to need eye tracking. They're very interested in that. Uh, authentication and purchasing commerce, like password typing and passwords, that'll soon go away. Um, Gaze-based heat maps, this also goes along with advertising. And there's just a tremendous opportunity. Remote diagnosis, which I didn't even really sort of know about that. Uh, a lot of optometrists and ophthalmologists want this headset because it's very affordable and because you can actually diagnose a lot of diseases uh, quite early as they show up in the eyes first rather than elsewhere. Um, there's going to be display productivity, for example, uh, having lots of different screens that you can type on. You won't have to reach for the mouse. You just look at a screen, start typing, look at another screen and start typing. For, for engineers, they, this is the one they're the most excited about because uh, it saves them reaching over for the mouse. Web navigation I'll talk about uh, a little bit real quick. Uh, so what are the most immediate impacts? And this is just my speculation. Um, the most immediate impact will be this tethered VR, which is the world we're in now. Uh, this will soon be gone. This will be an embarrassing bridge technology that we'll all chuckle about in a couple of years because putting on a Vive or Rift is akin to putting on a scuba suit. Uh, we all want to get away from this. Um, and foveated rendering and eye tracking technology are needed for the all-in-one VR headsets that are coming our way um, from Oculus, from Intel, Qualcomm, uh, not to mention all the Japanese, excuse me, Chinese HMD manufacturers uh, who want to have an all-in-one headset because and not only does no one in the West spend $1,700 for a high-end gaming PC, no one in Asia does either, right? So uh, tethered VR will soon be going away, and eye tracking is going to be needed uh, for the savings on the, on the GPU side and also on the battery side. So that's going to be the biggest impact is uh, we will be an untethered VR uh, sooner than most people think. Um, so basically, for anyone who knows how your eyes work, when you're not focused on in, in anything, uh, your eyes have a series of just what are called saccades, which are sort of these darting movements. They're very fast sort of darting movements. And um, this is just an in-house, us just sort of a speculation on what it'll be like, what the web experience will be like. There won't actually be a, uh, uh, there won't actually be a, a uh, tracker that you'll notice. This is just for illustration purposes. But the point here is we think that the web interaction is going to be much more nonlinear. 
you're going to be looking at something and it'll know what you're looking at. It'll bring up supplementary information, almost in the sort of magical sort of quality of it knows what you're interested in. It'll follow where your gaze is. It'll anticipate your needs, much in the same way that Google autocorrect knows that if you type in HED, it must mean you're searching for the hedgehog eating a carrot video. And in fact, that is what I'm searching for, and this magical prediction quality. Eye tracking is going to have this sort of same quality. And uh, this idea that you're going to exist in a world of these rectangles with a bunch of scroll bars, and you're going to be scrolling up and down, uh, we kind of feel that's just going to go away. A new generation of UI and UX users within uh, designers, we think within VR, are going to have a much more broader, much more branching experience where data is brought to you as you need it, rather than you just sort of searching it out. So um, the idea of like the scroll bar of this, this really rectangular frame, um, we think that'll certainly be in the, the physical world, of course. Uh, but if you're going to be productive in a, in a VR experience, uh, we think that's largely going to go away. And that's why I threw on here, just because for giggles, I, I really love vestigial icons, icons of hardware that just no longer exist anymore. And uh, I like asking my nieces and nephews, uh, what is that thing in the bottom of the screen? Uh, they have no idea what a microphone from the 40s looks like. Uh, they don't know what gears are. They have seen a magnifying glass. My personal favorite is the voicemail icon, which consists of somebody snail mailing you a cassette tape. Uh, and then um, my nephew has no idea what that inside the green icon is. And uh, no one I know below 20 has seen a three and a half inch floppy, much less knows why you have two of them. Uh, and uh, so these sort of icons of just like technology that'll soon be going away. Why do these still exist? Why do the 20 year olds ask us, what is this thing? Uh, I, think the, I think part of our current UI UX is going to go away, and it's going to be some brilliant young 18-year-olds are going to completely reimagine uh, the interface. Games, uh, really quickly, shooters and esports are going to get rethought when you can just aim at something just by looking at it. Uh, also, for things like League of Legends and games that are measured by clicks per second, uh, that's going to have to get rethought as users are going to be interacting pretty much at the speed of thought. Uh, we have a demo on the other side of the room. Eye tracking right now only adds about an extra eight milliseconds for total motion to photon. So it's still less than 30 milliseconds. So basically, as fast as something moves, you look at it and you can shoot it. Um, so those particular industries are going to get, uh, need to get rethought. Medical, uh, remote diagnosis, again, I didn't really know about. There's a lot of people really excited about it. It's very affordable. It should be able to get these five, $600 headsets into uh, remote care units and things like that and do all sorts of diagnoses that we couldn't do before. Uh, retail, this is going on now, VR-driven focus testing. So. Uh, put people in cars, you can redesign the entire interior of the car and measure their eyes and what they're looking at and still have the haptics of the, of the steering wheel. And now you don't have to like physically alter the interior of the car. Uh, so this is actually, these are the short sort of most immediate impacts. Uh, long term. Uh, so the long term in the tech is uh, the streaming on the server side. So uh, everyone wants to get to live, real time, 4K spherical streaming video. And just as you, uh, you do that foveated rendering locally, which is just on the graphics card, uh, along with things like prediction, saliencing prediction of what do people actually look at, that'll be done on the server side and extra frames will be sent down. Because it turns out people really kind of look at the same parts of other people. So when you're doing server prediction, uh, you can send down an extra few frames and not have to actually wait for someone to update locally, send a request from a frame, send it back down. Uh, so I think eye tracking will, will certainly help folks like like a Verizon, like an Orange Telecom, uh, like AT&T, like Ericsson uh, uh, in the long term. Uh, your AI, your digital assistant will seem really perceptive because they'll know exactly what you are looking at and what you've been looking at and what you're interested in. Um, design for truly interactive narrative. There's a lot of folks, uh, we're working with some folks uh, like at the Frame Store uh, who are very interested in uh, volumetric performance capture so you can be in a space uh, with performers who can make eye contact with you and then know what you're looking at and the narr narrative can change uh, based on what you're looking at. There are some folks right now that are doing things like, um, folks like Ape Lab and Minefield Games that are doing sort of gaze-based narrative. So the story changes based upon how you look around. So you might hear dialogue as people are talking, but if you make eye contact, you hear their internal monologue. Um, just sort of the example of the creativity. Uh, advertising, um, full face mapping and emotion mapping. Can we click on this link? I think this is the YouTube uh, clip we can go to real quickly. Uh, so um, the next stage along with eye mapping is full face mapping. Um, yeah, if you could just, yeah, just move ahead to anywhere. Uh, I think we've got bogeys coming in at 6 o'clock. Right. So um, eye tracking is simply eye shape mapping. 
along with the mouth mapping, is all a part of emotion mapping, uh, where it is you can extrapolate with a high degree of competency, confidence based upon people's faces, what they're feeling. It's usually between three and six sort of emotions. Wow. And, this is um, such a crazy planet. Okay, that's fine. Can, like I'm a little over. Jungles, and I can uh, see like the Arctic. It's a, not the best, best view of your fellow human beings. Uh, and um, so advertisers are going to be particularly interested in knowing what you're looking at and what you're feeling while you're looking at it. So uh, the challenges, um, so I don't know if anyone saw Michael Abrash's Oculus uh, OC3 Connect talk where he talked about the challenges of getting 100% eye tracking 100% of the time is in fact a very serious challenge. That will take years. Uh, what's right around the corner is uh, useful eye tracking right now, much in the same way that voice tracking is good enough, but if you're Australian, sometimes you really hate Siri. She just doesn't seem to pay attention, at least that way Australian friends tell me. We still have a ways to go uh, with voice tracking. Uh, design, I won't drill down into this because I'm over time. Uh, eye tracking is going to be additive uh, in that you'll still actually probably have a haptics device, but it'll be so much faster than any device by itself. And then lastly, there's going to be uh, enormous debate around uh, the nature of eye data. Uh, as we all know that some data is more sort of private or public than others. Our location data, we seem happy to share. Our medical data, maybe not so much. Uh, and there's debates around your eye data is really sort of an expression of your thought. Thought doesn't really happen just in your head, but it happens in your relationship to the world. What happens when platform providers can simply follow your eyes and essentially follow your thought in a way? And what is the nature? Who owns that data? What's the status of that data? So there's definitely going to be a community challenge around that. And with that, I will wrap up. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker in this lineup, um, also from the software side, um, Chris is responsible for product design and brand strategy, and he leads a team of programmers, oversees 3D motion graphics, um, and VFX artists. To about a year and a half ago, where one of our customers turned to us and asked us to create a, a 360 production. Um, there were no tools at the time. Um, I actually told them to go away, leave us alone. What, what do you expect me to do with it? There's, you know, there's nothing to create this with. But they're, they're excellent partners. They've been with us for about two decades. So um, I asked them to give us a couple of days. And basically what we did to create um, Cinematic 360 is we put together a DIY solution in After Effects. And it was messy, and it was horrible, and it was gnarly, but we delivered. And we delivered beautifully on time and on budget. Um, this is around the time where YouTube announced that they would be supporting 360. And when, the, when our customer disclosed, uh, disclosed that to us, I turned to my partner and I said, that's the end of our production business and our service business, and we're going to go head deep into product development. And we, started, we created a bunch of products for After Effects and Premiere Pro that basically uh, Adobe, the pro for the Adobe ecosystem, that basically make 360, cinematic 360 VR production very, very easy. So, as an After Effects artist, you just keep working the way you've always known, and we take care of the madness that is getting it into the spherical world. So um, there you go. People are saying it's very difficult to create for 360. I beg to differ. Um, this is an illustration. Actually, it's a photo of one of the first rigs I saw. It's actually bicycle parts glued together <laughs> with... Uh, cameras and lenses and somebody's put scotch tape on this and they actually managed to put together a camera that could acquire data to put together spherical uh, footage. Um, I think this is the spirit of, of the whole community. It's really a DIY community. Uh, they, they're loving the medium and they're just finding ways to make it work and that, uh, that sort of reflects in what we did. Again, we started as a DIY. It really made its way into a product in the next little way. So. Uh, since a year and a half ago where people were DIYing, uh, there's a whole slew of commercial cameras available out there and stitching solutions to help along. Notice the dot, dot, dot. I gathered these images in about 15 minutes this morning. <laughs> and uh, you, if you do a search for 360 cameras today, it'll blow your mind. It just keeps going on and on and on. So again, uh, people are saying the medium is difficult to write for, it's difficult to create for. I, I beg to differ. Uh, we've, we've sort of uh, made things a lot easier on our side in software. Um, I don't think the, difficult, the medium is that difficult. I think the challenge is still the same. The challenge is about storytelling. The, that, that's the diff it's always been the difficult part. So 
Uh, what I keep going back to the naysayers and the people that are, are the, or the whiners, as I call them, is um, here's a real challenge. There's a real challenge. Tell me a story in six words or less. It's still storytelling. If this is just a medium, and this medium actually makes it easier for you to tell your stories. So the answer to this, or at least one person's take on this, is the following. And I think it illustrates the point that basically much of a story happens here. It's not happening on a flat screen, and it's not happening really in the HMD. It's really theater of the mind. It's really that suspension of disbelief, and it's really a storyteller's talent that makes or breaks an experience. Um, our products... Um, cross-platform, Adobe After Effects, Premiere Pro, we make it easy. There's a bunch of shipping already. There's more to come. Um, we've put together a bunch of very, very practical tools. We're starting to look at stylization a lot more, which is very important. Uh, previous to our tools coming into play, you couldn't even do a scene like this. What you're looking at up here is studio lighting. A lot of people thought that you couldn't do this because how am I going to get rid of a director? How am I going to move that lighting out of the way, for, for if, if we left it to the naysayers, you couldn't even shoot the shot because you can't even have that lighting in play. So you, there would be not enough lighting in the scene to actually even shoot it. The cameras are not sensitive enough to do that. So um, what our tools help to do is basically take everything that we know and love from cinema, flat cinema, and just make it easy to do in 360. So you would use compositing techniques. You would shoot what we call a clean plate get rid of that HDMI and, tra excuse me, and transform it into a scene like this. So now you can grade, now you can do object removable, now you can do every little trick, motion tracking, everything that we know and used in cinema, we can bring it into 360. Um, we also accommodate 3D plugins uh, and 3D uh, software like Cinema 4D, Maya, so you, people can actually create invented places in a cinematic way, not like Unity 3D, where it's a rundown parent. It's a pre-rendered, but much like any CG movie that we've seen and loved out there. Um, impact on society. I, I won't go into details. Go to our, our, our website, go to metal.com forward slash vlog. The impact back is, has been unbelievable. These are long stories, I can't tell them. Uh, I, I, I don't have enough time today to, to talk about them, but I will be back later on this evening. I, I'll. I'll I'll, I'll fill your ears. <laughs> um, this is another great story. Um, this will be shown at Sundance. Actually, a lot of our content creators' films are being shown at Sundance this year. Very proud to be a big part of that. Again, I can't give you details on this, but I will tell you later. Um, this is a gang called Riot. Riot are a bunch of journalists that got together and adopted. Uh, they were acquired by Huffington Post not long ago. So it's a bunch of kids from uh, LA, USC, UC, the, usual, the usual universities. Um, what they did is they adopted 360 and, uh, for journalism purposes, but they sort of deployed on their website and they put an actionable item. So. They're using the media to gain the empathy, gain, 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 uh, gain support, basically. So we like that a lot. Uh, met with them, spent a lot of time with them, and have continued to work with this group. So again, another way where 360 is bringing back to society or giving back to society. So this is a behind the scenes. It shows them talking about us. This was unsolicited, I can, I can assure you. Uh, it's just a very nice gesture, but it shows, like, if it, uh, this is on our website, too. If you want to take the time to look at this and listen to what they have to say, they talk about workflow. All our customers always talk about workflow issues, storytelling techniques that can help you along if you're interested in the media. So I'll move along there. There's the website, um, metal.com forward slash blog. Spend time there. It's well worth your while if you're interested in this. I'll try to show you some new stuff. Again, we've done a lot of practical we're out? Okay. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Hi. I'm over? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So I'd love to highlight how um, we have very different types of perspectives here. You know, folks coming from the universities as well as from industry. Um, one question I'd like to ask the group, how do you see, you know, someone um, participating in different projects with you? Um, particularly um, if you're looking for partners, what types of um, technical, whether it's engineers, designers, um, people who can prototype quickly, who is it that you're looking to work with, um, particularly here in New York City? Okay, so um, 
most of our efforts have been outsourced around the world. Uh, we're, we feel fortunate enough to look at the whole world as our sort of playground, and, and we can tap into pools of talent everywhere. So we have a team in Germany, we have a team in South America, we do have a team in Russia as well, and we'd like to ramp up our North American presence as well. So we're always looking for very, very smart engineers, no doubt. Um, hardware experience, not necessary. Um, OpenGL, OpenCL, CUDA languages, we've got that covered. We're just looking re for really, really smart people. That's, that's the main criteria. On the art side, we constantly run a little, um, um, call it a lab. Uh, I think it's important to be testing a lot of our products in as real world conditions as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So we do keep a group of artists in, in our labs and try to simulate sort of real world scenarios as much as possible. Yeah. Um, just basically, we're looking for developers who know that eye tracking is coming and they want to get ahead of the curve. Uh, so we primarily looking for developers who are at Unity, Unreal Experience, but also OVR, OSVR. Um, and it could be entertainment, but particularly interactive narrative, we're also interested in supporting those folks as well. Uh, the headset is out at the end of the year. Or you can contact me uh, either, you know, come by and talk to me a little bit later on today or, or go to the website. But yeah, we're just looking for people who are interested in how eye tracking is going to uh, impact their particular corner of the world as soon as possible. Do you see potential with uh, making headsets available for university researchers? Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, an initial uh, relationship with especially medical researchers. We're a Tokyo-based company. I'm out of San Francisco, so we have a relationship with the University of Tokyo right now. Um, and um, there's, we hope to announce things soon around ALS that we, we can't announce it right now, but we're very interested in supporting medical researchers as well. Mm -hmm. With do you guys still hear me? With Sketchfab, um, our development team is actually in Paris. So if you want to be in Paris, there's a ton of stuff on angel.co slash Sketchfab. Uh, as far as like working with me and the Unity group, it's really open. Uh, like For example, next Monday, we have a group meeting. Welcome, stop by. And we do a lot of stuff with just people that walk into the door. You want to learn Unity. You want to learn how it is to work in the industry and do different stuff like that. Stop by. Sign up for the group. <laughs> well, can you just share a little bit more about the meetup? So how do people perhaps um, participate in the game jams? Um, how, at a workshop, how much can they expect to learn? Um, what experience might someone you know, come with? We, we don't do a ton of workshops. Um, we're more hands-on. So we, we, we tend to push people more into groups because there's a ton of stuff in New York, like play crafting. Um, some of the other events that are being run, we, we want to work more with people that want to come in and have some experience. Uh, the, with the game jam, like the VR jam, that was when VR was like brand new. Like really, no, there was no Udemy education. There wasn't really anything online for it. So we spent a lot of time teaching people that day. Um, but my recommendation would be to, to go to thecleanup.com slash UD3D, sign up for the group, uh, stop by, see what people are doing, and then we do a lot of affiliate stuff with the other groups in the city for education. Great. So at, at the NYU X Lab um, and the Holodeck effort, we are interested in both uh, with students and individuals who want to get engaged in our activities. We have contact forms um, on our website, holodeck.nyu.edu. And then at the um, academic and corporate collaboration and partnership level, we're interested in uh, having deep discussions and partnerships with you, ranging from technology exchanges to uh, ongoing long-term research endeavors. Um, so we're actually, um, with Mobile Augmented Reality Lab, we're partnered with a number of uh, universities in China, much doing most of the work over there. Um, I've just also started from the startup side, uh, a research lab in um, Xi'an, China. And we, it's good. All right. I have another question um, regarding uh, VR and um, the intersection with data science, AI. Um, I know, Jim, you brought up eye tracking technology, which is very much um, new data, so eye data um, that you believe is this um, new almost currency. Um, so how, for everyone you know, on the panel, could you share what do you think for this intersection of VR and AI, where is that going um, to be in the next year? 
Okay, so it's interesting meeting uh, Jim and talking about uh, depth of field and, and, and um, specifically um, eye tracking because these are, these are discussions that we're having with camera manufacturers as well as player to player. Uh, so when I say player, I mean the YouTubes, the Facebooks of this world. Uh, stereo is resolved only proper, oh, properly resolved only when depth of field is in play. In cinematic, it cannot be a pre-rendered thing. It has to happen on the fly. It has to be based on tr eye movement. And these are the kind of discussions that we're having with a lot of the major players out there. So we'd like to see that happen. Uh, so this is about AI, the interaction. I guess in the next year, um, one thing I could see happening, and this is just a quick nugget I'll throw out there, is a UI, UX that's machine learning driven, eye track based. And so in other words, a very complicated UI that's modular. And then it turns out, you know, I think we've all seen the heat maps on websites, the F shape, right? If people generally talk and look in the upper left and then not so much in the lower right. Uh, imagine UI UX designers not actually doing the final layout of a particular interface, uh, but setting up a modular way to having it informed by users' actual gaze, right? So if people just don't end up looking in the lower right for next page or refresh or whatever you put there, over time the machine would move it to where people are actually looking, where their eyes are aggregating. Um, and uh, you basically, you're, you're designing the way the machine will ultimately end up with an AI after hundreds of thousands, millions of, of uses. So it'll do the eye tracking. So within the next year, I think that's probably the, uh, the most realistic that I can think of. I'm really interested in a lot of speech AI, a lot of like emotional responses with little fuzzballs. We've written uh, a human-like AI where when you talk to people, th depending on how you treat them, they respond to you differently emotively and get angry with you depending on like your reaction to them. Um, being able just to speak commands for like mobile VR is very fascinating to me as well. Um, like with the recent release of Google Home and a lot of these different products, like I can do a lot just by speaking just very casually. It's very like 1970s Star Trek in, in you know, your apartment. So that stuff's very interesting to me. Um, so a lot of the work of the holodeck came from our group's early work in AI and machine learning and uh, creating emotive characters that would have real-time nonverbal interactions, scriptable agents, deploying these uh, individually and um, into cinematographic environments with multiple and many of these agents active. So uh, on our team, we have the head of the NYU Data Science Center. Um, we've got Ken Perlin creating these amazing agents. Um, and then with the human dynamics, we see this capacity to build that out. Um, so. You know, I think in terms of a year, our goal for our first year is to build the initial prototype uh, with as much of the different modalities functional at a moderate to low uh, quality level. And then in our second year, to raise the bar, pushing those as far as we can. So we're in that um, multi-iterative phase of making our instrument as powerful as we can uh, and making it modular and open so that we can continue to add these um, interesting, amazing technologies as they evolve. Um, you know, um, virtual reality isn't exactly my field, but what I rub up against you know, here in kind of the of AI, I, um, you're hearing them kind of optimizing the stream from the umbra. I'm looking, seeing, and then you can have the AI is basically doing the action that building on top of what they're doing. All right, I just got a cue for time, so we um, will open this up to um, questions from the audience. Um, so if anybody would like to ask any of our panelists um, a question, please raise your hand and we will have someone um, come up to you with the mic. I think Brandon over here. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I was really happy to hear Jim talk about the ethics, uh, but I didn't really hear, I haven't heard much in this conference talking about that. I'd be curious to hear everybody else's perspective on like where ethics fits in with what you're doing. Uh, Okay, this is a longer talk, but, uh, and I'm speaking just personally, not as a representation, representative of a, of a company. Um, yeah, I think there's a very interesting conversation that we as a community have to have around, I'll just speak to iData, just, just to focus on that, and I'll, I'll offer an analogy. Nobody knows where Twitter is. They know where the building is. I can tell you exactly where the building is, but we don't know where the space is, right? And we all know that different language is appropriate in different spaces. So. Things I could say in the bedroom, I wouldn't say in the boardroom. Things I could say in the locker room, I wouldn't say in the classroom. And we all kind of know that let certain things slide. You know, when you go get lunch with coworkers, there's a cone of silence. You can say whatever you want in the car on the way to lunch because 
because it's understood that we're in a certain space. Um, but Twitter kind of blew that up. And as a culture, we don't really know where Twitter is. Right? So there are things people have said on Twitter that's ruined their careers. Because they kind of thought they were saying it in a bar. Turns out they basically, the rest of us treated it as if they were saying it in a public forum. Right? So uh, there's an example of a technology that advanced beyond our ability to digest it. I think iData is going to be the exact same problem. I think iData is going to force some very interesting uh, ethical challenges. There was a reference to COPA early on. Uh, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, 2007, I think it was updated in 2011. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of women who are very concerned about data and have had very negative harassment experiences in online. Uh, and then, you know, who owns that data? There's, there's a whole school of thought that, um, I mean, how many people here know what redirected walking is in VR? Does anyone know what redirected walking? Okay. So the basic idea is that you can force people to walk in a circle, not force them, but basically you can get people to walk in a circle and they think they're walking in a straight line, right? Based upon how the, the, the VR experience changes slightly. Uh, they turn more than they think they would. So they feel they're walking in a straight line. They're actually walking in a circle. And so there's a concern of something around redirected thinking. If I can get you to gaze in a certain place, and if your gaze is a representation of your values, how much would that actually change your values, right? If we know exactly where you're looking. So there's, there's going to be tremendous challenges, and I think they're going to get resolved by us as a community. Um, and I think we are you know, just beginning to recognize what they are. And I don't think the conversation has even started, as far as I'm aware. NYU and at most uh, universities, you have um, internal review boards, ethics boards, where you have to test and um, propose all the work that you do and have it approved. So all the participants are uh, either informed or the risk is so low that they don't need to be informed um, as assessed by the, the review board. Um, I take a, you know, kind of two points to this. One is that, uh, that aspect on the individual basis. But uh, also, uh, thinking about Richard Feynman, Nobel physicist, um, thinking about how technology leaves a free hand for the future. Uh, in my work in, in technology, there's been a concern that if we don't deploy some of these technologies in the learning sciences, is it ethical not to provide these tools that we can help people understand their quitting behavior and how to overcome it? And so there's kind of you know, this um, encumbrance uh, on innovators and um, the ability to advance technology to provide technological solutions and understand, and then for a societal dialogue. So we want the combination of scientist citizens and citizen scientists who are able to have the conversations about the kinds of policies and environments that we want. And I think we've seen in the gaming environments abilities to create new worlds and to start to foster some of those communications. Again, with the eye tracking and you know, um, we have the ability to, to start to explore what are you thinking in this world? What are you thinking in that world? Which kind of worlds do we want to live in? And so that's one of the promises. But again, uh, a very rich ethical space. Thank you very much for the question. We have time for one more question from the audience. Over there. I have a question for Chris from Metal. Do you also have plans to make uh, interactive 360 Europe, which is not just only gaze or click? Do you see, like, can we see that something yes. very soon? So, so branch narrative is definitely next for us. And that's going to require, I mean, we could do it, you know, with proprietary HTML5 driven players, but the real play is, of course, at the YouTube and the Facebook level, right, for mass consumption. So definitely that's on the horizon. Yeah. No ETA for you yet. It, it takes many to do this. It's not just us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. This is uh, the wrap for our panel today.